Okay, this meeting is now called to order. Should I announce what meeting it is? Special meeting in person, City Hall Chambers, Seaside, California, 530. Roll call. Commissioner Lobo? Present. Commissioner Walton? Here. Commissioner Daniels? Here. Commissioner Moulton? Commissioner White? Here. Commissioner Gaines Lynch? Here. Vice Chair Nielsen? Here. Chair Maxwell? Present. For the record, we have a quorum. Okay, thank you. Um, item number two public comment. Members of the public wishing to address this commission on matters within the jurisdiction of the city of Seaside, but not on this agenda may do so during this time for a period of up to three minutes. Com comments on specific agenda items are heard under that item. For the public record, please state your name. Members in the public in the chamber, please approach the podium if you're wishing to make public comment. Good evening, commissioners, uh, city staff, members of the public. My name is Tanya Rose. I'm here representing the Blue Zones Project Monterey County, and I just wanted to come up and say congratulations. Um, great work, city staff, in receiving that big grant um, for Laguna Grande Park. It was in the Herald. Um, that is just terrific. Um, I know it was a long time coming, lots of work and still more work to come. Uh, but I think it's really fantastic what's starting to happen around that park. I attend several of the JPA meetings as well. And just seems like there's a lot of really interested synergy um, and a lot of great collaborative relationships across uh, both city staff uh, from the city of Monterey, uh, city of Seaside, as well as the Monterey Peninsula Regional Park District. That park is such a gem. Um, and so critical, you know, for human, wildlife, um, recreation, activities, open space, all the things that we want to support. So congratulations, um, more good things to come for the city with uh, that infusion of dollars. So great job. Thank you for your comments. Public comment is still open. Is there anybody on public or uh, on the Zoom? You don't no. do Zoom. Okay, one last call. Public comment is still open. Okay, public comment is closed. Okay, item number three, A, approval of the minutes from the January 22nd, 2024 minutes. I move that we approve the minutes from January 22nd, 2024, with any necessary corrections. I second that. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to approve the January 22nd, 2024 minutes. With any corrections? Anything under the questions? No? Is it a roll call vote or just a vote? Standard Boys. vote. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Seeing none, motion carries. Okay, number item four is a review of the agenda. If there are any items that arose after the 72 hour posting deadline, this is the point in the meeting where a vote may be taken to add the item 
to the agenda. A two thirds majority vote is required. Is there anyone on the commission wishing to add anything to the agenda? No? Okay. Do we need a motion to move on? No. Okay, moving on. Okay, business item 5A, a review the draft parks and recreation master plan. All right, commissioners. Well, it's hard to believe that it's almost been a year since um, we started this process and council approved uh, the contract with conservation techniques to perform the park and recreation master plan. I know you've all been participating over the last um, 11 months um, in a variety of different ways. And we have Mr. Steve Dew here that will go over the draft plan um, with the hopes of getting one last final um, in, little bit of information from the commission and any of the public. And then we are planning on bringing it to the city council for adoption next month. So um, without further ado, Mr. Steve Dew. Good evening, commissioners. Again, for the record, Steve Dew, Conservation Techniques. Um, just have a brief PowerPoint presentation to walk you through some of the highlights from the draft plan. And let me see if I can get this. There we go. Um, so my intent really tonight is to do kind of the high level pass over of what's in the document and hit on some of the analyses and the goals and the project list that are reflected in the draft plan document. I recognize it's a 200 page document and you only recently received it. So um, for tonight, it would be helpful to take in kind of this high level review and then uh, see what kind of discussion we have. And if there are additional edits, feedback or comments about the content in the plan, I think going back through um, Dan is probably the appropriate avenue uh, as a next step. So for, again, tonight, just walk you through some of the high level materials, uh, what we heard from the public, the structure of the plan itself, uh, again, goals and key projects, and then get some feedback. So just as a, a refresher, um, the intent of this plan document is that it will serve the city as its next 10 year guide for um, all things parks and recreation. So it'll be that strategic plan that lays out where the city's focus should be, what those in future investments should be, um, and set a, set a tone and a, and a set of goals for the city to incorporate into the general plan and to move forward on making improvements to the city's park and recreation system over the next many years. Um, again, as a reminder, uh, the community engagement process was uh, varied and diverse. We tried to engage the community in a lot of different ways. Um, and I know many of you participated in those uh, different tactics we used. I keep touching that, sorry. Uh, you know, we had the community survey, English and Spanish. Uh, it was online and mail out. Uh, multiple events for tabling to get people where they are. Uh, community open house meetings, stakeholder discussions, uh, discussions with this body, um, and then a couple city council touch points over the span of the year long process. So we've heard from nearly 600 participants through the process. We got, I think, really good base information, primarily from the survey that helped guide uh, the direction of the plan. Some of the core themes, the, the big takeaways from all that public engagement, um, one is taking care of what you have. So a lot of community interest and desire for renovating and upgrading existing properties and existing parks. That includes playground upgrades, ADA enhancements, um, co compliance around ADA, making sure people of all abilities have access to uh, the different amenities that the city offers. Um, as well as addressing safety and maintenance of existing facilities and parks. Um, and then the second big theme really is about expanding recreation opportunities. So providing more things for folks to go out and do within the park and recreation system. 
such as um, upgraded playgrounds that are more diverse, uh, that could include all-inclusive play or um, fully universal play. So again, people of all abilities and all ages can interact with um, play equipment. Um, splash pad was another popular item that was noted through a direct outreach as well as the community survey. Um, as well as providing different types of facilities that either the city currently doesn't provide or doesn't provide many of. Things like additional areas for family gatherings and picnics, um, hardcore futsal or um, pickleball space, um, additional community gardens, even though there are many of those today. Um, so you can see from the list that the, the notion of expanding opportunities takes a lot of forms. It also includes art, it includes trails. Um, and also user conveniences, things like uh, improved signage and wayfinding um, and, you know, basic things like restrooms and um, care and, and management of the existing properties. So within the plan document, um, there are a number of different ways in which we looked at the existing seaside park system and uh, assessed the current condition, quality, and um, gaps that, that are within the city today. And those gaps, as you saw from a prior presentation last time I was here, uh, included a series of maps that walk through uh, travel sheds for the different types of amenities, whether it's uh, sport fields or playgrounds or parks in general. So the system analysis looked at the distribution of parks. It looked at physical access to parks, me meaning ADA accessibility, again, who has physical access. Uh, again, the diversity of the types of amenities that are within the system, as well as uh, looking at events, programs, and other activities. So we try to pull it all together. Um, and we did that thematically through different chapters. And I'll touch on that in a moment. Um, in terms of some of the gap analysis, this map that's on screen really is the um, synopsis. It's the summation of all of the individual uh, travel shed maps, and it, it helps really focus on those areas in white that represent those areas that are currently underserved in park space and identifying potential locations for future acquisitions, which then carry forward into the capital project list as itemized activities that the city can choose to pursue via budgeting and uh, pursuit of property acquisition in the future. So again, the intent here is we're identifying gaps and needs, and we're translating that into specific projects that the city can pursue through the project list. Similarly, uh, there's a discussion in the plan document about trails and uh, the conceptual recreational trail graphic is on screen. And the intent here, again, is to connect existing parks to uh, the four tag trails and ideally through the center of the city to go kind of in east west direction. Um, to tie the community together. And potentially that could include utilizing alleyways or street rights of ways to enhance those connections and enable people to move more smoothly uh, through the community and, and again, serve some of those underserved areas that exist today. The analysis within the plan also looked at um, not only trends, uh, regionally and nationally, but also data from the National Recreation and Park Association, which is the, the National Association for All Things Parks and Recreation. Um, they put together an annual uh, summary of uh, national statistics. So it's a self-reporting sort of process. So jurisdictions from all around the country get asked every year to fill out a bunch of forms. And the NRPA compiles that data. So we have access to annual information that looks at median information from all agencies, but it then also breaks it down by um, population size of each community. So looking at Seaside, it falls within that category of 20,000 to 50,000 in population. So we can look at, again, the median across the nation, the median for kind of the small mid-sized cities and where Seaside is today. 
um, just scanning the the chart that's on screen that kind of uh, yellowed column on the right um, you can see the comparison between seaside and the the national data and overall seaside's uh, pretty comparable to those other jurisdictions across the country that are within the same population size with a couple exceptions um, primarily around soccer fields and around rectangular multi-use fields which could include soccer fields so as you know, uh, within Seaside, there's pretty limited number of existing soccer fields, and that just comes through in the data. Um, otherwise, again, the, the city is doing a good job in providing a range of amenities that aligns with um, populations of similar size or cities of similar populations. The analysis also looked at um, different metrics that uh, could be used for uh, benchmarking going forward. Um, those metrics include data from the community survey, things around public satisfaction, um, you know, relative importance of parks and recreation, um, sense of maintenance and upkeep. Um, but it also looks at the site condition assessments that we conducted. So again, when our landscape architect visited all the parks and, and looked at the quality and condition of those, um, it's something that can be repeated over time. So you can kind of track if you're doing better or uh, need more attention going forward. So today you've got a, a solid B and that's a good place. There's always room for improvement. Um, and there's a lot of detail in the plan itself on a site by site basis of recommendations and suggestions for improvements. Uh, the metrics also look at um, uh, translating those travel shed maps into some numerics. And to do that, we basically say within the travel shed, let's say it's a half mile service area for parks across the city, we can then calculate the area that that serves relative to the total area of residential land and we create a percentage. So you can see that um, within a one mile service area, 68% of the residential area within Seaside is pretty well served. But if you drop that travel shed down to a half mile, which is kind of a traditional 10 minute walk or, or nearby park experience, um, that percentage drops and therefore the grade drops. So again, it's a way to benchmark where the city is today. And if future acquisitions come on or future um, enhancements to parks come on in the future, then again, the grade can change and you can track that. Um, so we looked at both parks as well as trails. Um, and also from the survey looked at um, kind of the usage and visitation uh, metrics that we, we, we gleaned from the public. So again, it's just a way to snapshot where you are today that you can then hopefully utilize and replicate in uh, future endeavors. So transitioning a little bit to how the plan document is structured. Um, it's structured much like any other traditional city plan. Uh, so the, the front end really is the context. It's an introduction and overview. It's a profile of the city of Seaside. It's a discussion of the public process that was used to hear from the public, as well as the current, you know, inventory and classification system within uh, parks. The middle section of the plan really is the needs assessment. So it covers those analyses that I just walked through. Um, and again, it's topic oriented. So a chapter on parks and open space, a chapter on recreation and events, chapter on trails. And within each chapter, we start off with national trend information, what we heard from the public, get into the analyses and suggest some recommendations, improvements, enhancements, um, again, at that topic basis. Then we start to pull it together at the tail end of the plan with um, goals and action items. Again, those are set thematically. Um, and then other, the project list and implementation and strategies. Um, so I'll touch on the project list in a moment, but before I do, I'll walk you through the goals. Um, I, again, I believe you saw this in a previous presentation, so I'll go through these kind of quickly, um, just as a reminder. So there are a number of goals in the plan. Again, 
set up thematically. So the first goal is around community engagement. And the intent really is to encourage active and ongoing participation, making sure that the public knows about this commission and utilizes this commission as the forum for discussions about parks and recreation. But also uh, this goal encompasses uh, the city's outreach and communications and other ways to engage people, whether it's volunteerism or um, other direct outreach and partners partnerships. Uh, goal two is about diversity. And uh, here it's about ADA accessibility. It's ensuring that uh, all members of the public have access to and can utilize what's within the park and recreation system. Goal three is about maintenance. Uh, so the longevity of assets, making sure things are well cared for, that safety is addressed, and um, it's a good aesthetic and the system is generally cared for. Goal four about resiliency and sustainability is um, one that touches on addressing or being prepared for climate change, making sure that there's sustainability built into the parks, things like utilizing stormwater uh, capture options within parks design and, and being uh, in innovative in the sense that you're bringing new concepts together into the park system that are greener and softer and more sustainable. Within parks and open space, the, that goal really is about um, providing a, a nice suite of passive and active recreation and just building on what the city already offers. Uh, recreation, arts and Events also is about building on what the city offers and just making sure that there's a varied and inclusive suite of uh, amenities and programs that enable year round activities, social engagement, and a lot of different ways for the community to come together as well as to recreate. Trails is what it sounds like. It's about connectivity um, and just having a set of policy statements in there about uh, coordinating with the broader city's transportation system, linking to and supporting the FORTAG uh, trails network and coordinating with the county and adjacent cities to make those connections happen. And then lastly, administration and management is really about the leadership to pull it all together, keep it moving forward, seek the grants, look for funding um, and support staff. So now it's about the projects. So as I noted, um, there's a series of specific project recommendations within the plan document. I'll just walk through a few of them and uh, hit on some of the highlights. So within the realm of park development or park enhancements or improvements, um, a few of these should stand out for you. One is to move forward and do the renovations at Lincoln Cunningham, Havana Solis, and Capper Parks. Those have all been designed, as you know, and uh, moving forward with those improvements will be a, a big improvement for the neighborhoods that those serve. Uh, we've identified a series of playground upgrades, as well as additional site master plans uh, that could be completed to bring the public together and, and help renovate some of those existing uh, parks that are a little underserved for their neighborhoods. And in that process, do so in a way that can bring in some of those new amenities, things like all-inclusive playgrounds, a splash pad, um, additional sport courts, more picnic areas, things that I referenced earlier that we heard from the public. Another big piece of the project list is filling some of those gaps that exist uh, within the city. So finding a way to support acquisitions that uh, fill those gaps, particularly in the, the Terrace and Olympia neighborhoods, uh, kind of in the downtown core. Trail connections, uh, supporting and partnering to uh, work with the, the Fortag project to pull those trails together, but also take care of the trails that you have. Um, some of the pathways through the parks need um, improved uh, pavement. So pavement management is a big piece of it. 
Um, and with that goes ADA compliance and ADA accessibility. So repairing and upgrading entryways, access to parks, making sure tables and benches, benches are accessible um, and utilized in a, in a variety of ways. And again, improving wayfinding and signage. So the park project list or the improvement plan um, is intended to be a tool for staff and the commission to talk to the city council. And it's not a budget, but it is a list of projects to help guide future discussions. Um, it's set up such that um, each project is it's a line item, it's costed out, and it's sequenced um, best guess uh, in terms of what might be a, a reasonable time frame to do projects. Quick snapshot on that total project list. It rounds up to about 44 million, uh, which is a huge number. But that number is uh, about 50% or a little more than 50% related to acquisitions. So again, some of those gaps that I noted earlier on a map uh, translate to about half of the project list in terms of total cost. Uh, so there may be opportunities to seek donations or dedications through development processes or grants to help support some of these projects going forward. So in terms of next steps, uh, as Dan noted, uh, the intent is to get your feedback on the draft and ultimately move forward to city council review and approval. So with that, I'll take any questions or comments. Uh, Dan, is there anything you want to add? Thank you for your presentation, Steve. Are there any questions from any of our commissioners? Uh, Ms. Walton. Thank you. This is just clarification. Some things that just weren't clear to me as you were going through. So on page seven, which was your gap mm -hmm. analysis, the white areas. Okay. Um, the, what do those letters correspond to? Like A? Yeah. What, what does that correspond so to? So within the plan document, chapter nine or 10, there's a list of projects. And they are cross-referenced on the list of projects. So you can see which ones where, how much we've identified potentially they might cost okay, and when you. they might happen. I knew it was something yep. easy. Like that. <laughs> and then on page nine, the systems analysis. This one? This yes. one? Yep. Okay. I can't figure out what is happening here. So the amenities in the blue is, is the second the light blue amenity, is that a roll up to the dark blue amenities? I can't figure out what the difference is. What's happening here? Okay, so for each line item, for each line, there's an amenity. Let's take playgrounds. So for playgrounds, the all agency category is the median of all reporting agencies across the country say that they provide one playground per 3,759 people. Um, so these are per number of residents per amenity. So it's one playground for 3,700 people nationally. And then if you look at the column for the cities in population 20,000 to 50,000, which Seaside is, um, it's one playground per 3,028 people. And using Seaside's specific data of population and amenity counts, because we counted everything, um, the city currently offers one playground per almost 2,000 people. So the city is providing more playground opportunities than the average, if that helps clarify how this is structured it does okay thank you and then <laughs> the um dark blue median acres per 1000 yeah so the median acres per thousand is um just one of many ways that 
park agencies kind of kind of capture the information about what they're offering. So they add up the total number of acres that they have and divide by uh, population at a at a one thousand unit. So uh, the city of Seaside has one point nine acres of parkland per thousand people, whereas nationally, all agencies it's ten acres per thousand people. Okay, thank you very much. I yep. actually was having difficulty reconciling your comment that we were doing well with. No, we're not. We're like way below so, everybody else. Yeah, and that's a fair point. So the notion of the gaps are clearly reflected in the acquisition or the acres per thousand metric here, the top line. Um, the other thing to note about Seaside's park system is many of your parks, as you know, are small. So you can have a lot of parks, but it doesn't add up to a lot of acres, right? So if you do the division, you're still left with a small number of acres per thousand people. Thank you for that. And thank you for the master plan. You can tell a lot of work went into it and we appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, thank you for the clarification. Any other commissioner have questions? Uh, Ms. Lobo. I do. Um, thank you. This has been a long process. I just would have wished that we got the final one. Um, more than five days. Um, I try to review it, do at least 40 pages a day for the 205 document that was sent to us, uh, which was impossible for me. So I got through half of it and, and most of it um, was allocated to some of the information we provided and then also through the town calls. Um, I did have a question with regards to the acreage um, because when we look at this, uh, we are far below that acreage across the nation. Did I understand that correctly? Mm -hmm. um, are we incorporating the 92 acres that we that we still haven't developed on as well, or is this just current our current acreage right now without um, the development that's happening where the courthouse is? So that was my it, question. Thanks for the question. This is representing current acres and current amenities. Yep. Thank you. Uh, my next question was regards to the development process to get grants and donations. Can you give us some examples on past projects that you've um, contributed a master plan like this and what they developed in order to develop that processes? Um, I think that would be great for us to know because that process will need to be solidified by our staff and then um, you know, followed. But can you give us some examples? <sighs> We have worked with other jurisdictions outside of California more directly on grant applications and state-based grant processes. I know that California has um, a number of grant processes that local jurisdictions can apply to uh, to get support. Um, Dan, you may know better than I do on uh, some of these, but they are listed in the appendix under the state grant section. Uh, so, you know, from our experience in other jurisdictions, um, we've utilized or they've utilized these plans to secure um, state level appropriations as well as um, state level grant dollars to enable development or acquisition of projects. Um, I could give you a specific list at a, another time, but I've drawn a blank on details at the moment. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, my last question was with regards to the priority list. Um, that was the recommendation that you are providing. Is that the recommendation that you'll be providing to the council as far as what we currently have and what we have allocated? And uh, does this is this indicative of the new grant that we just received for the trails? Um, and has that been incorporated in the final? before it goes or will it be incorporated in the final before it goes to council the new grant is not yet incorporated so we can adjust the document to reflect that um, and as far as the project list and the sequencing and and the prioritization that's part of that i'm certainly open to this commission's feedback on that list if uh, certain projects feel or should be weighted higher or um, moved up in time 
I'm definitely open to that feedback. At this stage, this is a, a draft for discussion. Um, so if there's more feedback or thoughts on how this list gets put forward to city council, we're totally open to that. Uh, Commissioner Daniel. Um, thank you for your presentation. Mm -hmm. Uh, my only question was uh, around like the recreations part. I don't feel like that was presented as much as the park side, but I was going through the, uh, the master plan and one I noticed in community survey that a lot of residents uh, like requested the, the need for more rec uh, like recreational activities. Mm -hmm. But then in the report, it said that there was a limitation due to indoor facility capacity. I was wondering if you could speak on that more, on, like how that hindered um, like your research, like did you stop at a point because you realized that the facilities couldn't or like what was the, the process of developing more community programs? Sure, sure, great, great question. And within the recreation chapter, uh, one thing that we really relied heavily on is this a review of the city's existing suite of programs going back multiple years. Um, and in looking at what's offered uh, we were able to break it down by age group, by category, um, and in a couple of different ways. And it was pretty clear that, again, the city is doing a really good job of providing a variety of different program types across the year uh, to meet local needs. The I think the rub or the uh, limitation is, is twofold. One, it's staffing, and two, it's uh, indoor facility space. So if the city had additional space capacity to do more programming, um, then I think there would be an opportunity to expand beyond what's currently offered. Um, I do know that there uh, it has been some past discussion of uh, additional uh, community space assessments. Um, so maybe again, Dan can, can reflect on that or add more. Yeah, so um, as Steve was saying, you know, I think as the recreation director, I want to be able to provide as many programs as possible, right? You know, we, I feel we we do offer a lot, but there is some areas that we can, can you know, that we are lacking in, but he is 100% right. Space is really challenging right now. And I think, I think most of the meetings that we go to, we talk about what's our number one need, and it's probably like an indoor gym. Right. Like if we had an indoor gym, the amount of programs we could increase tenfold, whether it's sports, whether it's community classes, whether it's, you know, just a variety of different types of activities. Um, Oldemeyer Center is great, but there, you know, it gets used for events and a variety of other things already. Right. So I think we need to look in the future and like some of the development that you were talking about, you know, um, Ford or um, Main Gate or whatnot, Campus Town if there's any way that we could potentially get, you know, whether it's a new community center, whether it's a gym, whether it's something that can provide more indoor space, I think we can really then push the pedal and go farther and do more um, recreation activities. Um, you know, we are at, you know, I don't want to say we're at capacity, but there, you know, there's not a lot more we can really do. We can try and switch some things up here or there, but I think it is, it's that it increase nature that we're we're really looking at. So, I mean, I would I would just like personally like that to be reflected in the in the document, mm -hmm. and then I was I kind of want to see a little bit more detail whether like how much these programs are reaching, how many people are participating. I don't know if that's available to you, so I might be asking for two minutes. Yeah, on that second point, uh, we didn't have that sort of data available to us. Yeah. Um. I know that a lot of the bulk of the budgetary is geared towards acquisitions. Um, I didn't see in the document that uh, one of the priorities was to um, engage acquisitions that provide um, indoor space. But I understand that during the town halls and the surveys, there was a big push that we needed an indoor space. Is it reflected in there um, as one of the points? It It is reflected in the recreation chapter where it talks about um, the limitation on indoor space. Uh, and the, the project list tries to address the capital investments. So um, again, I can 
work with Dan and, and with your feedback about modifying this list so that it's a stronger point. Thank you. Hmm? Commissioner Nielsen. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I think I only have one comment or question regarding the developing and enhancing the three parks that were highlighted. Um, Capra Park, I, maybe the other parks have it too, but Capra Park has a plan. Is that plan just being, has been reworked or is that the plan that you're using so for, for capra it, it goes back a few years i think a couple years old um and that's just reflected as a carry forward sort of item in this document so it's kind of staying the same yeah that plan is ready to go really like so we have a full master plan for capra park which is included in this document mm -hmm. so that way when we are ready when we have the funding we we really it's almost I don't want to say it's turnkey but we have everything needed to go for it um, and I do believe that that I don't know off the top of my head but I think the budget amount for that is a million dollars or something in that that neighborhood based off that plan so it's really just coming up with the funds to put that into place and prioritize prioritizing that and then when we talk about uh, structures. Is that something that you go into or is that too detailed? I mean, as far as what the materials are that are that are used? What are the... Yeah, so that level of detail is typically left for the community dialogue that happens around the design of a park rather than not the high level system wide plan that we're putting forward today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have any concerns or additions or anything? Excuse me. I would like to uh, also uh, echo the concerns of Commissioner Daniels and Lobo about the uh, uh, getting behind uh, more facilities in the city where they're much, much needed. Um, and thank you again for your presentation. It was very well done. Um, any other? No? All right. Okay, thank you. Um, public we're comment. Open it up for public comment now. Thank you. Thank Members you. of the public wishing to make public comment on this item, please approach the podium. My foot's asleep. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Tanya Riss. I'm here representing the Blue Zones Project, Monterey County. Uh, thanks so much for the great presentation. I've been following this process as well and exciting to see uh, where it's at now. I'm actually curious. I'd love, I don't know if you could give me a copy of that document. I'd love to look at it. Um, uh, but great conversation, great points raised uh, by you all here at the commission. Um, you know, with all these things, the devil is in the details and the implementation plan, I think, is so critical. So I'd be curious to, you know, to look deeper at that. Um, I know, uh, you know, I think just to the extent that you can provide recommendations and best practices regarding sustainable funding, I think grant funding is fantastic. There are dollars out there that can provide infusion um, of resources and, you know, looking at the long term scope of the city budget, or maybe even looking at perhaps a bond measure, you know, to support parks in the long term, I think is something that, you know, could be to be considered. I'm sure you've seen examples of that, you know, in other municipalities, um, as well as staffing, uh, you know, recommendations to really um, robustly support um, the expansion of recreation programs and the park amenities. I mean, it's it's so, so, so critical um, and building a sustainable budget and sustainable staffing model, I think is is key to the long-term success of this. So yes, curious to see about that. Um, the piece around youth soccer fields uh, is a big deal. I think that's a huge opportunity, particularly given the changing demographic of, of the city. Um, you know, I know we had spoken about um, MOUs with Monterey Peninsula Unified School District. Um, I don't know where that ended up, um, but also potential partnership with our Monterey Bay FC, you know, football club that's just here. I think there's lots of opportunity there. 
Um, I was definitely curious about the acquisition piece and that 24 million is, is pretty hefty um, in that budget. Um, just thinking about, you know, one of our neighboring cities, Marina, for instance, they're going gangbusters and building lots of parks and those dollars are coming from, from um, agreements they've made with developers. So, you know, just thinking about that, um, thinking about some, some money that can be kind of negotiated, you know, these folks come in and, and build and address our affordable housing, um, but then also investing in, in city parks as well, I think is critical. Um, Additionally, I really appreciate the focus on addressing the system gaps. Um, so important, you know, to look at those white, you know, those white areas that are, are missing um, parks and open space. Um, thinking about alleyway activation, you know, as a way to address that. I know you mentioned it a little bit. I'm wondering if there's more kind of more depth um, in the plan itself, but there's a lot of alleyways in the city that, you know, I think could have some really interesting and creative opportunities that we've seen across lots of municipalities in the US and around the world. Uh, but really exciting. Thank you so much. Happy to be part of the conversation. Thank you for your comments. Public comment is still open. Everyone is welcome to make comments. Hi, my name is Ramona and I'm here representing BOSPA. Uh, which has a meeting tonight. And we were just curious, and Diane brought it up, about CAPRA. So, um, Dan, thank you for letting us know that it's done, because I think we're all in, under the impression that it's just there and we need to work on it more. So, glad to know that. Um, and the million dollars um, that is needed for that park, um, I know we have to ask the council for that, but can that be divided up? Can you do we just need one million to get it all done? Can't we do three, 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 or something like that? I mean, uh, can you answer? I know you're not supposed to answer, but uh, thank you. Oh, and a great presentation, by the way. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, in regards to splitting it up, that would be something that would need to be, you know, discussed with public works and engineering just to figure out how that would best be decided. Um, I think that that could potentially happen um, coming to the count, you know, at the council level and, you know, figuring out what the best, like the phase would be, right. You know, phase A would be this and then B and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so I, I don't think it's impossible, but, you know, there's more future discussion that would need to happen. Thank you. Public comment is still open. <laughs> Hey, no one on Zoom? Oh, we're not doing Zoom? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, my bad. I'm old now. Get full. Okay, public comment is closed. <laughs> okay, moving on to business item. What? Are you, or do we need to motion? Or... You don't need to motion or anything, but is no there matter. anything else? I, I mean, uh, my recommendation would be just to go one more bite at the apple here. Think about it. Um, anything you want to, you know, address to Steve or myself, um, you know, the, now would be the time to do it. I'd also entertain, you know, why we're working before we become the draft plan. If there's anything that pops up while you are continuing to review it, you can email me. Um, but just want to make sure that while you're here tonight, you have one last, you know, round of questioning if there's anything on the dais. Okay, Commissioner Lobo. Um, are, is this being brought up at next week's city council or, or the last one? Right now, I'm still working that with, with Steve. We're looking at either March 21st or April 4th. Okay, um, and so when would you like us to have our final comments in, um, and I'm only asking because I haven't had an opportunity to look at the entire document, so I want to make sure I don't miss anything. But when would you like us to have those um, recommendations? Sometime next week, I think, which should be sufficient. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Miss Commissioner Nielsen. Since we do have another opportunity, when we talk about... Uh, longevity and sustainability 
And I know this is in the details that is not pro probably much of um, in the uh, master plan at the moment, but as far as uh, native plants and trees, it, it, I would expect that that would have a um, be considered well when those things are chosen. So, um, yeah, again, the um, within the goals and objectives section, it identifies some language in there about uh, replanting, uh, adding trees, uh, using native and uh, locally appropriate plants within the system. So the language is in there to support those efforts, but it's not at the fine level or fine grain detail that it is on a site-by-site -site development plan, for example. Because again, that would come through in a, in a site master plan that a community comes around and says, we'd like to see this happen and that happen. And then the notion of uh, native plants, uh, bee pollinator garden, and, and, and all that good stuff that you do would come through on the site-specific master plan level. Okay, so irrigation or that type of thing would be during that period. Yes. During in that. Yes. Part of the plan. Yes. Thank you. Again, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Okay, time to move on. Okay, here we go. Business item 5B. Uh, discuss the aspects of the blues and the park planning. And that was brought up by Commissioner Gaines Lynch. Oh. Together one day. Thank you. Well, yeah. My question would be about the Blue City Park planning is what are the vendors going to be? How is the vendor going to be selected? I know it has changed from the previous years when I was a vendor. So I'm wondering what's that plan for vendors as well as the music. When do we get to know who are the groups gonna be? I don't know. <laughs> are you asking me? Oh, Dan, oh, okay. Mr. Mewis, do you have any knowledge of any of that? Yes. Okay. So um, I'm currently right now in the process of working with um, former council or with council member Pacheco. And he's, you know, this is one of his projects and we are working on setting the lineup right now. I will say that we have three bands confirmed. We have the fourth one that is tentative right now. So we are looking at the final one um, before we, for the five headliners, um, we'll be releasing that once we get the fifth one. Um, when it comes to the vendors, we have the vendor application. We're It's ready to go. We released the vendor application for Blues in the Park, I want to say, in May. And when we release it, it is released um, through our distribution list. We will email every vendor that we have on our list. We will send them a mailed copy as well as an emailed copy. Um, and then there's the... The open date, whether I I believe it's the end of May. And on that day, it's first come, first serve. So we normally email it out and mail it out about two weeks prior. And then it's first come, first serve for the vendors or for the applicants to come in, submit their vendor application. And then we review them um, based on that. And then whoever comes in, if someone comes in and they are selling tacos and burritos and they're the first person selected then we will not allow anyone else to come in and sell tacos and burritos if someone else has that and they're next in line we will say hey can you sell something else we already have someone else that's already selling this item um, and so on and so forth we generally have four to five vendors for this um, event it it really ranges depending on the um, the applications that we get sometimes we get all savory. Sometimes we get, you know, a split between savory and sweet vendors, and we like to mix it up and try and have as much of a variety as possible. 
Um, you know, a lot of it does depend on too, because sometimes some vendors come in, they put in their application and then they can't work through the process of the health department because they got to make sure that they're also following all those health department standards as well. Um, vendors need to have a seaside business license and they also need to make sure that they are following um, our plastics ordinance, which means that they can't sell any um, water and water and plastic bottles. It all needs to be in aluminum cans. Um, or boxes. They can't, um, all of their single use um, condiment or not condiment, cutlery or utensils and stuff all needs to be compostable as well as their um, plates and um, things like that of that nature. No styrofoam is allowed. Like there's a whole list that we send out for with the vendors and it has that information um, with all that as well. So there is, you know, we, we did have to change the process a little bit because of the updates to the plastic ordinance. Um, and vendors are still, you know, we are working with them as best we can, as we know, you know, it's always, you know, it's a new situation going on, but we have to make sure that we are following, um, the policies that have, have been put in place. Hopefully that answers your questions, but if you have anything else, I'd be more than happy to, to help. I do have something else. Uh, my next question is about, um, uh, food trucks and tents, because I know food trucks has a new ordinance as well. So will they be allowed or tents? Or a food truck is allowed at the park. Um, if you're using a tent, then you need to make sure that you're following the health department rules with that. Um, but food trucks are allowed at city events. They're just not allowed on Broadway. So if we have an event on Broadway, food trucks are not allowed there. But but throughout, you know, for our city events, you know, if we're contracting them, they are allowed. That answers my question. Okay, very good. Uh, Anyone else? Oh, Commissioner Lobo. Um, I have some questions. Is there a blues committee? There is not a committee. No. We've so, never had one. Right now, um, and how it's done been done in the past, it's just been the recreation director and uh, Mr. Pacheco um, along and, with that. And really with, with um, Council Member Pacheco, he just has all the contacts. So he'll shoot me the contacts and say, you know, I'll be the first to say that blues is not my uh, my music of choice, if if you will. So I, I I go off what he's been doing for thirty years, and so I'll get the contacts and I'll and I put together the contracts and everything. So um, I, I will say in the the nine years that I've been doing it, they've been new bands every year. I want to say there's only been a handful of bands that have come multiple times since I've been here. So it has been a really good revolving um, door, if you will, of different blues acts. Um, what has this commission done in the past um, during those five weeks that the blues in the park happens? Over for a brief period of time, um, the Parks and Rec Commission would table um, at the blues in the parks. Um, Art and History Commission has also tabled as well. Um, but that really, it's just tabling and, you know, sharing information about the commission and anything else that will be going on in the field of parks and recreation. I mean, we can figure out ways to kind of increase um, participation from the commission because obviously, you know, we want to, you know, get you out in the public too. I think that right there, the networking piece is, I think, the big piece for the commission because if, we're not there, the community doesn't necessarily know what the commission does, right? So there's a lot of downtime at Blues in the Park and it's just more of having another booth to educate the public, you know, and, and kind of take their information and, and, and bring it back to these meetings and, and, and say, you know, hey, we, you know, we spoke to 15 community members last week at Blues in the Park and they're really, um, you know, passionate about trees or, or whatever it is, something that we can bring back here and make, put things into action that the commission can do. Um, my next question was with regards to animals and service animals. I know that we talked about a little bit about that before and um, what is the recourse or the plan of action moving into this this year's season with regards to that? So that that is an ongoing um, challenge that we have to deal with. Um, dogs are not allowed in the park um, for this event, you know, we, we try and make it as clear as possible. It's on a lot of our communications and whatnot. 
a lot of the times people are just walking through the park. They're not necessarily going to the event. And if we see that, we'll try and have them walk along the outskirts along the trail and just, you know, kind of go through. There are people that um, do come and sit. You know, we we let them know that dogs aren't allowed in the park. Um, but if they do state that their dog is a service dog, there's there's nothing we can do, right? So we kind of, we'll just leave it at that. So, I mean, it is really a touchy situation um, and, you know, we're not going to, you know, go back and forth with someone on whether or not their dog is or is not a service dog. Um, do you provide anything for children that attend since this is a family friendly event, right? In the past, we've worked with um, my museum and my museum would bring the Wheelie Mobile out like one um, Sunday um, during the series, one thing we were going to look at doing this year is is doing um, more of like a family event day where we where we have we'll bring the bounce houses out and make it like not specific for every single event, but have um, have one event where we try and incorporate more family friendly activities. However, I'm not opposed to doing it as much as possible if we can have the staffing and we have the ability to to have um family friendly activities out there i think that that makes the most sense because you know you want a nice act, um, afternoon at the park you may have some little ones you, we all know that little ones may not be able to sit there and listen to the music for four hours so you got to have something to keep them active um, i think the parents that do come will end up taking them to the park but um i mean we can work with our local nonprofits, whether it's cpy or, or palenque and they table and a lot of the times they can um provide some activities for the kids, but, you know, just depending on what our rec staffing is like, um, we will definitely look at that too. Thank you. So I, have another question. I have another question. I dropped the next one. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I have another question. Um, my question was, I can't even remember now. My question was about uh, a suggestion box. If you know of a good blues group that might be good at blues in the park, is there a suggestion box? How can you recommend them to you or Dave Pacheco? So what happens, I do get a lot of uh, requests. They'll email me directly and then we will review them and see, you know, depending on where they would fall in. Um, we get a lot of our local um, opening acts that way. You know, there's a couple staples that have been with, you know, that have been performing at Blues in the Park for years. Um, but we do bring on some new ones and a lot of them do come that way. Um, people just reach out to me directly. Um, but yeah, if anyone has an idea or if there's a new and up and coming blues band, you know, generally we want to, you know, have some information, you know, if there's a, they can send us an audio file or, or you know, they, you know, if they have a um, YouTube page or something like that where we can review the music, that really helps. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Lobo. Sorry, I have one more question. Um, do we give priority to seaside businesses and bands? Or is that kind of like how is the vetting process? It wouldn't not to necessarily seaside. I mean, that's a good question. It isn't anything that we've really done in the past. I know we do give seaside local bands that do come um and perform. Um not necessarily like how if it's the priority or whatnot. I don't know how many there are, but it is something we can look at when it comes to um, the businesses. I want to make sure that we are trying to prioritize our seaside businesses. And I know the farmer's market's been doing that. Um, so, but with it being a first come first serve basis, it, it really does, you know, we, we're trying to make it as fair as possible that way. But we do have, I think, more seaside businesses that have been come that more are the forefront that we have added to our distribution list because of the farmer's market. So we're getting some of those uh, contacts and we're adding them to what we currently have. Anyone else? Okay, we're gonna open it up to public comment. Okay, public comment is still open. <laughs> Okay, seeing no interest in public comment, we'll move on. Okay, business item 5C, follow up on ways to increase public communication and outreach. Vice Chair Nielsen.
I don't really know why that's there other than we talked about um, sending information to churches and other organizations that may have a wider outreach for things in parks and recreation. And that's what I would like to see happen. I don't know if staff has any idea how we do that or if some of that is done right now. And um, the other thing that is difficult is oftentimes I'll have people tell me and I myself can't find something. If it's under recreation, people don't necessarily when it says city news and then you look at everything and it's like open bid for this, open bid for that, there there's nothing in that upcoming events or city news, I forget what it's called, but it's listed sort of at the bottom, I think, of the main city webpage. It's just difficult to get to information like, for instance, the... Um, the flea market that was held on Saturday. Uh, you, there was nothing listed in that upcoming events. And I could be using the wrong term for what it's called, but it's on the city's main page. There should be something that you don't have to go look at three different pages or try to find something at, th at three different pages that um, will tell you things that are occurring that you might be interested in. So. No, and that's a, a very valid point. And, you know, I think one of our challenges is making sure that we are keeping the website up to date. Um, it, it's hard for our staff. We, not everyone has access to update the website. There's only a handful of people in the city right now that have it. Um, I am one of them. And, I could spend hours trying to remember how to go back and figure out how to add something to that, right? It's it's one of those things where unless you are in it all the time, it, it, it's hard to remember. So um, I was in there today trying to fix something that I found that was like, oh, I got to you know make sure I, I fix this. Um, so we are trying to work the best the, right now in, within the rec department, there's me and one other person that have access to update the website. Um, so, and she's been busy because she also does our activity guide and she's a part-time employee, right? So we have some struggles in that aspect, but we do need to get better at that. And, and I acknowledge that. And, you know, we're going to try and figure out work with, you know, um, the communications team here at city hall to see how we can, you know, move that forward. Um, but I agree, we, you know, we, we do need to make sure, right. The flea market happened this weekend and it's not something that I'm looking at to put on the website, like in the city news, it's just, I got other things I'm thinking about. And that's just what it just didn't come to mind. You know, like we're trying to push it on social media and our, in our other ways. And I think we have so many ways to communicate and sometimes it's easy to forget some of them. Yeah, I can understand that. Um, so the city doesn't have some employee that does updates to like the main page who does the main page and would there not be an opportunity to just have you know this is coming up and there's a link and it takes you to the information on about it if that was the case things would be a lot easier this uh, website is quite cumbersome i will say it's not as easy intuitive um as i think we would hope um in a lot of those uh instances and i don't know what the capacity is over here but i know that there was people that had access that are no longer with the city right so now it kind of dwindles down and then it's getting new people access which is challenging i even found out today when i went to update like try to make updates like i don't have full access i i one of the pages within the rec department that I tried to update, I couldn't even update because I didn't have the access to it. So, it, and it's going and you find things out like that, like by when you go in there and try and do it. So, yeah. 
we need we definitely need an overhaul and you know i think that that's in the works at some point but like right now um you know we'll, we'll continue to work and 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 i will just say that if there's something that you know and you see you know let me know and we'll work with staff to try and, and make it a priority um to get it updated you know if i find things i go in there and i'll try and fix it but if i don't know about it i'm not proactively searching for it right now yeah and so there's nobody assigned to do that in the city which is unfortunate for our city's communication well and and this was something that did fall under the former uh, communication specialist that we had Right. And that's a position that we've been trying to recruit for. And we just haven't been able to find anyone to uh, fill that position. And as far as um, distributing information to different churches, organizations, uh, clubs, is have you done that before? Or is there an opportunity that's not so to talk about that and that's not difficult or cumbersome. So it isn't something that we have done that I'm aware of. You know, I think our big avenues for distribution is the school district. That's the group that I know, like when we have a flyer, I can send the school districts, um, contact our flyers, they get it approved, and then they push it out through their networks. You know, there used to be a time where we could go and we would drop off 300 flyers at every single school. And we would know that those flyers would come home in someone in, you know, in the kids backpacks. That's not the case anymore. Right. So un unless I don't have a detailed list of all the churches and like contact information. However, that's not to say that it's not out there. It's just not something that we have, at least through the rec department we have done before. And I can work to see, um, cause I know that there's the mysterious uh, ministerial Alliance I don't know who would have access to that contact of all of them um, within Seaside, but that would definitely be a way. If I had that list, it would be a good distribution list, another avenue for us to send them, you know, hey, here's a flyer of our upcoming soccer league. Can you please send it out to your congregations or whatnot, right? It's just, just not something that I have done in the past, but I'll look into, you know, see if I can come across that list. It, it's mostly, well, that's a great idea, but community input uh, from, you know, more diverse community input is kind of what I'm thinking about and how a lot of people don't go even to the city's website to find information out there about things that are happening. So that's why it's good to see I, if we can reach further out to them. No, and I will say that when um, Steve was here doing, you know, the community stakeholder groups for the master plan, I went through and I tracked down about 10 or 15 emails for the churches so he could get them included. So there was a section he tried to include them in his stakeholder meetings. Not very many of them actually reached out back to him um, to provide input. So while we were able to get some of the contact information, just whether or not they responded back to us, that's a whole other thing. Thank you very much. Commissioner games i'm glad that you put this on the agenda simply because today i was going through my facebook page and the flea market there were so many comments about oh i didn't know this was happening i could have sold a lot of stuff or i could have bought stuff or where did you find out about this it was just so many comments even i made a comment because i didn't know about it either so it's good that she said that. I don't know how we're going to reach him, but we need to reach and let people know what's going on because there's been several events over this past month of February that I have heard nothing about it. Black history events at Oldemeyer and other events. And it pops up when the pictures come up on Facebook. I was like, oh. I didn't know that was going on. So yeah, we need to get this information out better. I know, not giving a plug for Deja Vu, but they're on an events page that every time they have an artist coming, it shows what's coming to Deja Vu. And I know it's a local Monterey Peninsula page. Maybe we can get on that. Where's that? Where 
I, I see it on Facebook from time to time. I mean, I know oh. I will say that a lot of these events that we are, you know, we, a lot of them get posted on Facebook and Instagram regularly. Um, so if you follow us there, you know, you're good. That's one way to see what's going on. Another thing that I would say, you know, if you want to be more in the know, come down to the rec department and get an account created, um, through our, our registration software, because we are constantly sending out, um, e-blasts about a variety of different things that are going on. We also have a constant contact list too. While I know that not a lot of people, you know, check their emails or, you know, if you get a whole bunch from one um, source, you know, you might just, oh, the, you know, push it away. You know, it's it's hard, right? So it's about trying to reach people as many ways as possible. Um, but right now I would say social media is probably the way we try and get things out the most. It would probably be social media, then our e-blasts, you know, and, you know, one thing is what where we, I think, are our best are word of mouth. Um, I think that's where a lot of our stuff gets gets pushed out there. Commissioner, the flea market sale is this is this just a one time event, or is this going to be something that's going to be continuous? We this will I think this is like the third one we've done. We we tend to do um, we we try to do one every um, activity guide cycle. So like the the flea markets and the activity guide um we did the last one we did i think it was in the summertime and we're planning on doing another one um uh, i believe in august so those that did attend they would like this to do one once a month right so like they loved it you know and, and there was a good crowd and and it was you know really popular i would say the very first one we did didn't have anyone come to right so i think it's it's starting to you know it's starting to build that that momentum um and I think even though the, the spaces, we sold out of the spaces fairly quickly. So I think we had 20 spaces or something that we were able to fit in the hall. Um, um, so communication. Yeah. I, I mean, and that's communication is the key with everything, right? I think it's not necessarily the rec department. I think, you know, it's right. the city as a whole. We we got to figure out better ways and and be more effective and, you know, I will do my best to continue to push out, you know, what we can in the rec department um, as best we can. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Lobo. Um, so just back to the communication, I know we've had several conversations about that. Uh, so the city is looking for someone to be a communications liaison for the entire city and departments too. That's why we're seeing a lag on the website um, because right now our city clerk and her team is the one that's handling that, which is why they created the news portion where um, it's just a snapshot of stuff that is happening. The flea market was incorporated in that. And like Dan mentioned, um, not everyone has access to the website because it was specifically created so that the, com the communications person was giving all that access out. And once we lost that, over a year ago is really where we started seeing the fail in the communication. But as a whole, as commissions, um, we do have that one page that is linked to the website, um, which I don't know if we can begin to start adding that to our cards that we can get um, so that when we hand those out when we're having conversations with people, that is another way that we can um, rear them to that website and exactly where they can find like our page. Or we can take uh, Dan's recommendation to set up an account with the rec department. I know I get the emails when the pools are gonna be closed and stuff like that, or um, I'll get the information before it hits um, social media platforms. Uh, but again, I don't know who handles that, but perhaps this commission, like our particular commission can have an account and we would be the ones sending that mailing list out to folks with our individual information and that can tackle a solution to the communication barrier that we're having right now until we're able to hire someone to do that. I don't believe we're, any department can do their own communication aside from what they're doing individually now, but as a whole, you know, that is something us as a commission can bring to the city council um, under the clause of not having already having communication issues with the public and then our zoom accessibility being taken away as well um, when it comes to public comment 
So those are just some of the solutions that I have been mulling around how we can get the word out more. And then also the blues on, um, in the park where we can table or perhaps have a trivia portion during the intermissions so that each of us can go up there and do some sort of trivia and, and, and integrate um, folks at the ground level. Great ideas. And I will say too, like, and I, um, one of the other things that we recently added, um, especially because we've had to close the pool um, frequently because of staffing issues is we've been using this app Remind. So that way you can get text messages. So it's more frequent that we can send out these, you know, push notifications to your phone. So it's not getting an email. And that has been helpful for those that don't necessarily have an account that we can go and send the e-blast to. So um, in the in the rec guide that we have, there's a QR code. You can scan that QR code and we'll sign you right up for the Remind app. There's one for the pool. There's one for Oldemeyer. And we try and use that as another form of communication too. So we've tried to have a variety of different methods you know, to, to make things work. And nothing's perfect, but I think at least we are trying to be as creative as possible. Okay. Boy, if we're not done in anything, <laughs> it was a lengthy discussion. <laughs> Anybody else? Any thoughts? No? Okay. Uh, we'll open it up for public comment. <laughs> Seeing none, we're going to close public comment. Well, I have to be official. Okay, moving on to the next item, and it's reports from the recreation staff. All right, so um, you did hear from uh, Ms. Roos about uh, the grant that the city recently um, was awarded from California State Parks from the Recreational Trails Program. Um, the grant is for the renovation and improvement of the trails at Laguna Grande Park, um, basically starting on this side of the bridge by in and out and working all the way to um, the stairs at um, uh, Canyon Del Rey, not Canyon Del Rey, um, Fremont. Um, there, there is still some... Um, I don't want to say hurdles, but there's still some processes that need to go through with the grant. Um, I'm working with um, Caltrans and the Federal Highways and Waterways Administration. Um, we have to fill out some environmental documents and things like that in order to, before we are approved, officially approved. But the fact that the city was selected um, through state parks is a big, you know, big step in the right direction. I'm confident that we will get everything in and, and we'll be you know, ready to move forward on this. Um, that is, you know, going to work. It worked. The timing is perfect. It works in conjunction with the uh, Laguna Grande JPA. Um, as we are finalizing, we, we have the trail maintenance strategy in place. Now we are working towards getting the permits and the permits are needed before we can do any work with the grant anyway. So like right now, this is the right time for a lot of this. And, um, the environmental stuff I need to do for the grant will also identify the permits that we will need anyways to, to get it. So we are already a, a step ahead of that. So, um, you know, this is, it, it's still going to be, you know, maybe two years away, but it, you know, it's a step in the right direction and, you know, we're going to have some nice new walkways and trails on that, you know, on the seaside side of the lake, um, which will be, you know, a, really great for blues in the park for all of the events the farmers market um everything that happens out there you know those of you that have been there know that the trails are you know in in dire shape and this will give us a good um bike walking trail um for the future so really really good news about that i um, also want to just highlight that this Saturday we are going to be holding the unveiling of the redesigned stars and the so we're doing that for the first class from 1030 to 1130. Um, you can come out there and we're going to unveil the first class stars and get a picture with the mayor. And then from 1130 to 1230 we're going to have the reception for the VIPs and then the event itself will start at 1230 on Broadway for the new inductees for the third class. So we're really excited that this is happening. We're finally there after everything that happened. 
Um, and on Friday before the event is actually opens the nomination period for uh, 2024. So um, it's, a, it's a good segue for those that are there. And then anyone that comes to the event can see what we're doing and then potentially you know, get this paper, the paperwork to nominate the new for the new class. So I um, want to thank those of you that are on this commission that sat on that committee, um, not only this time, but the last year too, because you were all, you know, a part of this process and really just, you know, excited to get this one taken care of and done and then move on to the next one. Um, other than that, we have, you know, a couple of events coming up in March. Um, we'll have another meeting before that. So I'll hit those up at that point. Those are kind of my big uh, updates right now. So thank you. Thank you. And really congratulations on the grant and also the stars. Anybody have any questions or anything? Okay. Uh, the next item is reports from the park staff. Good evening, uh, Carolyn Burke, Assistant Public Works Director. And uh, so let's see, on our parks projects, we have Highland, Otis, and Fernando Park are both complete. We did have our ribbon cuttings delayed due to weather. Um, so we're working on setting new dates in March, probably around mid-March, but we need to get confirmation from um, from council members that they're available that day before finalizing those. Um, Lincoln Cunningham Arterial Trail Project, uh, we're working on 90% construction documents. And so, you know, right now we're anticipating a construction contract award in late June or early July, but we're trying to push and get that as early as we can. We know it's an important project for everyone. Havana Salise improvements, um, so those are the kind of revitalization improvements we're going to do in the picnic area. And um, we're scheduling installation with the contractor, and it'll be constructed in April or May. Um, Coutinho Park, the additional concrete picnic areas have been constructed. Paving, landscape, and, and irrigation have been installed. And on February 21st, they started the landscape maintenance period, which will go for 60 days. The outstanding items include just signing and striping, installation of picnic tables and benches. Uh, Sabado Park, uh, staffing's, staff is working with the contractor on an installation date for the new play equipment, but um, all the planting trees and golden gravel have been installed there. Um, so also a new picnic table and two benches made possible by blue zones will be um, arriving in March and city staff will install those. Uh, Wheeler tennis courts, um, Dave Fortune is working on the contract right now. And, um, but we know that the work has to be done because it's doing crack sealing and painting. So it has to be done when it's super dry. So it's probably going to be sometime April through June, but probably in the May, June range, just April showers. So, uh, yeah, so that's my updates. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Commissioner Walton. Quick question. What's happening yeah. at Wheeler? I know I should know, but I'm... Oh, it's moment. the Wheeler uh, tennis courts. Um, it was made possible by the Neighborhood Improvement Commission. They had provided funds for that. So it'll be crack sealing and restriping uh, for pickleball going on out there. Yeah. I, I have one question. Yeah. Um, you mentioned at Highland Otis that it's complete. Was there... Um, a plan to replace the sand in the volleyball area, or was that next? That is on our commission work plan. Oh, so yes, we still need to work on um, addressing that and um, looking at potential funding uh, mechanisms, but it was on the commission work plan to re get the sand replaced. Okay. Does anyone else have any? Questions or comments? Oh, 
Commissioner Nielsen. I think there was a misunderstanding because the uh, sand putting real volleyball sand instead of dirt and putting a, a, a mortar around that was supposed to happen like now. And as part of this project, you're saying? It was a separate, it was, yes. we asked, it was asked to be something that might be funded by NIC, but then Public Works, whether it was Dave Fortune or uh, it must have been Dave Fortune, said that they could just go ahead and do that. With just maintenance staff doing yeah. that directly. Okay, I can follow up with Dave on that. I think there was some mention of a donation of the material or something. Possibly by Somewhere granite. Not, yeah, uh, granite rock. I, I don't really know the details, but yeah. I do know yeah. that that was something that was, if that's not a big deal, we can go ahead and do that. Yeah. Okay. okay. And and that, would, that conversation happened back when the NIC was looking at what they were going to do with funds. Okay. I believe it was Dave Fortune who had the conversation with the steward of that park. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And um, did you have something? Um, uh, also, there was the the um, two projects for trees, and the one project that was somehow fell through the cracks was trees and parks. And that was either 4,500 or $5,000 that was allocated that NIC had a, um, recommended along with the residential tree giveaway. There were two uh, uh, recommendations and because they didn't have a staff liaison or I don't really know what happened, but there should be $4,500 to $5,000 allocated for the trees in the parks. And that I had brought up at the city council meeting last time and staff was direct, they, he direct, the city council directed staff to sort that out, but nobody knows about that. Um, did, have you talked I know you were working with Dave on the tree giveaway. Have you talked with Dave about the Well, with this works? one, you know, yes, Ms. Uh, Commissioner Nielsen had brought it up to city council, but I was waiting for more clarification. But I, my understanding, I know we need to look at too, is that we have to identify where we're going to plant the trees because, you know, $4,500, I mean, I think knowing the, the tree giveaway, right, we're talking maybe you know 30 to 50 trees potentially like where trees and parks exactly so but that's a lot of trees so we need to figure out where those trees are going to go and what type of trees are going to be put in there and we need to make sure that we are not we are mindful that we put trees in in parks where they're not going to be affecting view sheds they're not going to be potentially in a place of a park that's going to be renovated. Like we, like if we go and put trees up at Capra, we got to make sure that we're not putting trees within the area of where their master plan is because we don't want anything to be pulled out. So I'm still working with Dave on that, on figuring how we're going to work on this. You know, planting 50 trees, that's a big ask, right? So we just need to make sure that we're prepared and, and we do it thoughtfully. Okay. Um, this. Let's see. How can I say this? Um, I see the 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 roadblocks that are happening, and it really doesn't make sense. We've done this before, and we've been mindful of um, where we planted the trees. 
we chose uh, native trees, we chose, uh, you know, I worked with community organization, pretty hard doing these uh, plantings. And the master plan is not something that's going to be implemented in the next 10 years. Maybe one or two parks might be finished in that time. But if you wait to plant trees, you're not going to have any trees. I mean, you just can't wait for 10 or 15 years to say, okay, now we can plant trees. I, I don't, are you, you maybe miss, I, I don't know if, I, if I'm being clear. I'm not saying we're not doing it this fiscal year. I'm saying we need to have a more detailed discussion to look and identify where these trees are going to go. Like the, yeah. we're talking 50 trees. That's a big undertaking. And I need to work with public works. I'm, you know, I, I'm not qualified to plant trees and I can't direct a public works staff. So I need to. Well, the public works staff didn't plant the trees. Volunteers planted the trees and they are ready and willing like right now. And it wasn't an issue before. So I'm just, I'm just kind of confused about why it's a big deal now. Before there was it 50 trees? It was 30, 40 trees. Yeah. And, okay. I, I must. I don't think there were 50 trees. I, I don't remember. I'm just like, you know, guesstimating on what, you know, based off what we did last year for the tree giveaway and, you know, the cost. Regardless, I still need to work with Public Works to figure out getting the trees and, and all that. Yeah. And that could lead into June, July, August, where. Um... This has to happen before the end of the fiscal year. So it has to happen before June 30th. Okay. So th this this will happen, which is I need to work closely with Public Works because they're the ones that handle parks and they're the ones that handle, you know, getting the materials. Okay. Well, they will be handling getting the materials this year. Where the time before, it was myself and some other volunteers who went out and. Got the materials. But anyhow, so that's it's different this time, is what I'm saying. And it's it's slow, it's slower and it's unclear. And nobody has ever said, okay, yes, we know there's that money there. It just seemed to have turned into, yeah, we didn't know about that. And now it's, well, we have to decide where they're going to go. They can't do this and they can't do that. And it's just frustrating. I didn't know, honestly, I didn't know anything about it until it was brought up. You, you and I had some conversations. I knew about the free tree, tree giveaway program that we've been working on. I didn't know about the trees and parks. So this is something that is still fairly recent to me. I'm trying to understand so we can work to get it done. You know, you mentioned that you and the volunteers went and did them in the parks before. I was unaware of that. So I don't know how that happened or how, what the, form, the the process was prior. Okay. I know you may have done it with some of the free tree giveaway trees, but if there was something prior to that, then I don't, I'm not. No, it was the first time we did, we had uh, money allocated for uh, trees and parks. That was the first tree project. Wasn't that like $1,000? No, it was, I don't know, some thousands. I will, I, I reached out to Dave today, so I'm trying to get a hold of him and work on this. Thank you. And the other question I have is um, any update? I mean, I, I don't know. I forgot about where the bridge project uh, takedown is. Is it been, are they taking it down? Is it um. gone? <laughs> no, no. Uh, council has approved the contract to design the demolition and reconstruction of the bridge, and then we'll be putting the demolition out to bid, um, and then and then that'll come before council to be awarded. So you'll know about it before it comes down. 
Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Again, thank you for your presentation and answers to our questions. Oh, Commissioner Logan. I just had a comment about the tree planting. Um, I briefly remember hearing about that, and I know that there was some um, miscommunication on whether it was the, the city-sponsored one or the volunteer-sponsored one. And then it came back again in front of the city council, and there was um, discussion about where 50 trees were going to go because of what happened at Seaside Highlands when those trees were planted, and now they're uprooting um, sidewalks. And so I think that's where the conversation got in trend got lost in translation where it was assumed that it was a tree giving a tree giveaway through our commission versus this tree for parks city sponsored money where before it wasn't city sponsored it was volunteer sponsored and then it was not oh i don't all i'm saying is that's what i remember when that particular conversation came up cuz they talked about the trees that were planted at Seaside Highland and the uh, issues that they're having with it now. Um, so I just wanted to add that. I don't know. I, I, I understand that now it is more funding sponsored um, and now public works is involved. And I know that when we talked about planting the tree for Earth Day, we still don't have a definitive answer because public works has to be scheduled around that. So perhaps maybe that's the delay, um, but again, yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Moving on to reports from commissioners. Commissioner Daniels. Nothing to report. Commissioner Lobo. Nothing to report. Commissioner Gaines. Nothing to report. Commissioner Walton. Oh, oh wait. She <laughs> nothing to report. <laughs> Commissioner White. Nothing to report. Commissioner Nielsen. The thing I have to report is that at one of the FOSPA work days in the park on Saturday. There was an employee, Jack, I can't remember his last name, and he 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 was the Saturday staff that would bring the truck and great guy, and he was always helping, and he is now working in another part of the public works. And we had a, like a, like a, going away not that he's going away we had a little going away celebration for him and he is just a great staff person and uh it was really fun to work with him he's a good guy that's it very good commissioner Gaines. i don't know if you all have seen your ballots but my name is on the ballot and i appreciate your support thank you You did that. Anyway, I tend to, I I agree with Commissioner Nielsen and her uh, um, applauding the public works staff because I've noticed that uh, it's really a, a pleasure to see them working and work side by side with them. Um, they're really engaged in this community and it's a really a welcome sight. Um, I do have a couple things to report. Um, we do have on the uh, recreation side of things, a uh, soccer program that's coming up uh, with the police activities league and uh, the city Um collaborating efforts. Um, the signups are pretty much now and the games will be played at Catino Park. Um, soon after that, we have 
the junior giants uh baseball program that's you're able to sign up your kids for that's a free program but that's also through the city recreation department in collaboration with the police activities league and um i would like to thank the all the work that fospa does every saturday in different parks their efforts are really really ha have made a great uh deal of difference in the community um i do have some concerns of some recent um, gang activities that I've noticed in some of the parks on the northern end of the city, um, and we can't we can't allow the kind of stuff to take over our parks out. It was in the not too distant past where. Uh, I should say some unruly characters and, and drug activities and things like that were going on in some of the parks and and a lot of the public were uh, afraid to use parks, but we finally have, I think, uh, taken back the parks and especially with all the involvement with uh, groups like FOSBA and neighborhood uh, people taking ownership, um, and being proud of their parks, their neighborhood parks. So we just we just need to keep an eye out for things like that. Um, and er earlier today, I just want to share this real simple thing. I I took my uh, youngest grandson out to have Chinese food, and we had fortune cookie at the end. And my fortune, it said, surround myself with good people. And I think I have done that in my life. And I appreciate all you commissioners and all the hard work that you do. So thank you so much. Does anyone else have anything more? Okay, this meeting is now adjourned.